our youngest son was in fourth grade, he could not spell his own name. His brain had a problem. I discovered it standing in his elementary school hallway one evening, reading a story he had written about my husband, a military officer. At the top of his page, he has written his full name, Evan William Moore. He spelled William, W-I-L-Y-U-M. He went on to write, my dad is in the Air Force. People salute my dad. S-A-L-O-O-T. Our nine-year-old son was spelling phonetically the way words sound, like the average six-year-old spells. Fast forward three years to seventh grade, and my son, who could not spell his own name, was now enrolled in gifted and talented language arts. And by his freshman year in high school, he took two college-level English (coughs) courses and passed both of them with an A. How did he make that jump? Well, because of the brain's amazing capacity to change with just a little help, we aren't stuck with the cognitive cards we've been dealt, and neither was Evan. After nine months of brain training, Evan had a brand new and improved deck of cognitive cards. So what do I mean by brain training? Well, brain training or cognitive training is a general term for repeated engagement in targeted mental tasks that are designed to strengthen cognitive skills like memory, attention, and processing speed. There are brain games everywhere, but brain training is so much more than a game. If we want to harness the brain's ability to change through experience, a phenomenon called neuroplasticity, The brain training experience needs to be intense, targeted, repeated, and I might argue, facilitated by a human. So how do we know that brain training can do that? Well, in short, data. Since 2015, hundreds of studies have been published on brain training interventions, and my name is on more than a dozen of them. I'm the research director for a worldwide network of cognitive training centers, and our team has worked with more than 100,000 children and adults. That's about 6 million brain training sessions that look like this. And we've amassed dozens and dozens and dozens of stories just like Evan's, stories of overcoming struggles with thinking and learning through brain training. So I want to share with you three lessons that we've learned through our experience and research in this field. So lesson number one, cognition is complex. So brain training also needs to be complex. What do I mean by that? Well, according to the most widely accepted theory of intelligence, the cattell horn carroll theory of cognition, there are dozens and dozens of cognitive skills. Skills like working memory, long-term memory, processing speed, visual and auditory processing, logic and reasoning, and attention. If we want to have the biggest impact on thinking and learning through brain training, then we have to create interventions that target more than one or two cognitive skills. If we give you an intervention for your brain that only targets working memory, but we also expect that to improve reasoning skills, That would be like giving you a workout for your arms in the gym and expecting you to see results in your legs as well. So brain training programs that only target one or two cognitive skills are missing the opportunity to impact the entirety of cognition. So I want to do a quick demonstration just to show you what the complexity of cognition looks like. In just a second, I'm going to ask you to spell a word backwards, and I'm only going to give you 10 seconds to do it. Ready? I want you to spell the last name of the first United States president backwards. Ready? Go. Okay. Stop. Here's the answer. N-O-T-G-N-I-H-S-A-W. How'd you do? (laughs) 
I want to walk you through what your brain had to do to get there. First, you had to remember who the first United States president was. That's long-term memory. Then you had to decide on a strategy for actually completing that task. That's logic and reasoning. Most of you probably projected the word Washington in your mind or in the air. That's visual processing. Then you had to decide which letters went into the word. That's auditory processing. You had to keep track of which letters you had already said and which ones were coming up. So that's working memory. You may have gotten frustrated or distracted halfway through that task. So you had to engage your attention skills. And I only gave you 10 seconds. You had to work quickly. That's processing speed. So that one seemingly simple task engaged seven different cognitive skills. And it illustrates how those cognitive skills work together in order to to complete a task. But that doesn't just apply to academic tasks, real life tasks as well. For example, to be a good driver, you have to have strong processing speed, attention, and visual processing skills. To be good at time management, you also have to have good processing speed and attention skills and reasoning. So cognition is complex. Therefore, cognitive training should also be complex. Okay, lesson number two. Cognitive training is a universal intervention. Research is telling us that cognitive training is applicable to all kinds of brains. Children, adults, young and old, conditions like ADHD, learning disabilities, traumatic brain injury, and age-related cognitive decline. And what we see in research are changes in neuropsychological test scores, changes in the brain that we can see through neuroimaging, and changes in day-to-day life. So I want to share with you just a few of the research studies that we've conducted that demonstrate the universality of cognitive training. So in this study with children ages 8 to 14 who were struggling in school, we gave the treatment group 60 hours of complex cognitive training over 12 weeks. And you can see the clear difference between the treatment group and the control group on all of the cognitive skills we tested. In this study on children with ADHD, we gave them 60 hours of cognitive training over 12 weeks. And again, you can see the differences between the brain training group and the control group including a 26-point increase in IQ score for the brain training group. In this study on adults over age 50 who had age-related attention and memory problems, we compared two different methods of delivering the same complex human-delivered brain training program and found statistically significant changes on every skill tested for both treatment groups. And in this neuroimaging study of adolescents and young adults who were recovering from mild traumatic brain injury, we were able to document changes in brain network connectivity using functional MRI that directly correlated with changes in their cognitive test scores. And in a study that we conducted with soldiers who were recovering from moderate to severe TBI, 91% of them achieved overall recovery and clinically significant change in their cognitive skills and their overall IQ score. And these are just a few examples of the research that's being conducted on cognitive training that demonstrates its applicability for all kinds of brains. Okay, lesson number three. Brain training is hard work. So you want to see real-life benefits at the end. In the research studies I just showed you, we quantified change with really impressive numbers. Numbers that researchers like me dream about. Numbers that help our papers sail through peer-reviewed publication with the hopes of changing the world with our findings. But the changes that really matter are in the day-to-day lives of the people that we're hoping to help. For Evan, he could spell, he could focus, 
he could relate to other kids. For our research participants, the number one real life change that we see is an increase in confidence and self-esteem. But we've also documented improved motivation, mood, outlook on life, better relationships with others, reduced oppositional behaviors, better driving skills, better sleep habits, reduced academic difficulty and undesirable behavior, and increased performance at school and at work. Brain training is hard work, so you want a big payoff. So speaking of a big payoff, I want to leave you with a story of one of our research participants who has agreed to let me share his story with you. Jim was a married, very successful engineer. He was riding his bike one evening, and his bike hit a washed-out portion of the path. He crashed into a ditch, hit his head, was knocked unconscious, and wasn't found until the next morning by a group of hikers. He was in a coma and woke up a week later in the ICU. The damage to his brain was so severe that he had to learn how to walk and talk all over again. He was unable to return to work in his current profession. He struggled to show emotions. His ability to process information efficiently was severely compromised. And his life as he knew it was over. Eight years later, he joined a research study that we were conducting on cognitive training for traumatic brain injury. And just like Evan, he spent nine months working with a cognitive trainer, doing hands-on, intense, complex training exercises for his brain. And at the end of that nine months, we measured changes on his neuropsychological test scores, changes in the brain, and changes in real life. His results? He had a 23-point increase in his IQ score. Analysis of his brain functional MRI showed that the network connectivity in his brain had normalized, and he was able to go back to work as an engineer in the same firm where he was employed eight years earlier before the accident. He got his life back. Jim was dealt a horrible set of cognitive cards that night on the bike path, but he wasn't stuck with them. Even after eight years, his brain was able to change through cognitive training. Brain training research is such an exciting field of study and one that carries this message of hope. We are not stuck with the cognitive cards we've been dealt. Thank you.